Brother John West is married to the former Sonia Cottle. She, of course, works as our secretary at the church. They have three children, Lauren, Jonathan, and Joshua, one son-in-law, and one grandson, Seth. Had to magnify that a little bit. John graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching in 1989, Faulkner University in 1991 with the B.A. in Bible, Fred Hardeman University in 2002 with a Master of Ministry degree, Houston Community College Police Academy 2011, and received a Master Peace Officer certification in 2019. He serves as one of the elders of the Spring Congregation and he's a sergeant for the Montgomery County Precinct 2 Constable's Office. So just hope as you drive that way that you don't get him stopping you. Bad news. We are thankful for John. I can't remember, John, when did you all move here? 2007. 2007. Time sure gets by. And they've been a great asset to this congregation. We love him in County Missouri great gospel preacher and fellow elder, and we look forward to hearing him speak as he closes out this lectureship on the topic of one body, one hope. Brother John, come and speak to us. Thank you, David. So, Bruce, I didn't get any of those comments I have in the past. Thank you, David, for that. <laughs> Doesn't mean it won't come afterward, though. <laughs> it is my privilege to be here before you this afternoon. Had a wonderful lectureship today, and I want to thank all those other speakers who have been here and the fine lessons that each one has delivered. Jack had the hardest lesson of all because it was after lunch. Bruce had, I think, the next hardest lesson. So maybe everybody's gotten your nap. You stay awake from mine. If not, then take you a nap real quick, and it'll be over soon. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6 is the topic or the text for our lectureship today. And the topic that I've been given is the one church and the one hope. I'm not going to read the text. It has been read a few times today, but we do know, I'm going to look at verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And verses 4 through 6 give us the seven ones of that unity. Within this text, we find the very standard of unity. If you look at each one of those ones that are mentioned in verses 4 through 6, and if we base everything that we know the Bible teaches upon those ones, we not only can, but we will have unity. Christian unity has its foundation in Bible doctrine and teaching. Without Bible doctrine and teaching, there is no Bible unity. If we're going to have that unity, it must be based upon the Bible. Without the doctrine, we don't have it. But Christian unity also depends upon the desire of every single Christian to be united. We can look and we can know and we can believe that the Bible teaches unity, but if we don't put it into practice, we're not going to have unity. And when brethren today look at the Bible and follow the Bible, we will have unity. However, when brethren read and study the Bible and know what it teaches, but refuse to adhere to its teaching, there's not going to be any unity. We've seen that here numerous times and all over the brotherhood that when people refuse to adhere to the unity of the Bible and conform to its teaching, unity is not possible. Well, when we conform to the teaching of the Word of God, there will be 100% unity in the church just as not only Jesus wants but as He has demanded through His Word. Without desire, there cannot be unity. So the Bible demands that we have unity and we have to achieve it. We have to work at it. We must submit to the will of God in order to have that unity. And so folks, as we go through this and as we've looked at 
and heard lessons on these various subjects on these seven ones, if we adhere to all seven of them, my two being the final two, we can and will achieve that unity. I'm going to break this down into two different parts. Jack, I don't have three points. I think I've got five or six points, but I'm breaking them down. I think it's about six. In the one body, and then we're going to look at the one hope. If you look in Ephesians 4 and verse 4, the Bible says there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called one hope of your calling. Mine racks in the same verse. So that makes it even easier. But it still goes back to verse 3. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. How do we have peace? Philippians 4, 6, and 7, we have peace with God when we obey his word. We have peace with one another when we obey his word. But as we look at the one body, first of all, we know the Lord set the standard for the unity of that one body. If you go over to John chapter 17, and Jose talked about this this morning, I just want to touch on it for a moment. In John 20, verses 22 through 22, we can read, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Look back at that prayer. What was Jesus praying? Jesus, God the Son, had unity with God the Father and with God the Spirit. They are one. They're in total 100% harmony. And Jesus was saying that prayer that his disciples may have that same kind of harmony, that same unity, and that peace. That's what God wants today for us. And that's what God demands of us today. This unity has to be based on the high standard of authority and the high standard for unity. And that's through God's word. It's not a mere union. I heard old preacher say this before, and I've used it several times. You can tie two cat's tails together and you've got union, but you sure don't have unity. You put two mean old cats in a pen together. You're going to have a union. They're going to be together. There's not going to be any unity. I grew up here in the saying, they fight like cats and dogs. Folks, there's something to be said about that. Look at some dogs that get together and fight and they can't get along. They're yapping at each other or fighting each other. They may be in the same proximity, but it doesn't mean they're united. So it's not a mere union. It has to be true Bible unity. The standard of unity that Jesus sets forth here can be the only standard of unity. There are many in the church today that are saying just the opposite. There are many in the church that say, well, you don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to uh, agree on these certain points of doctrine as long as we can get along. I remember back in the 90s hearing this more, and Bruce pointed this out, about having us teach the man, not the plan. Well, let's just unite in Jesus. Not baptism, not instrumental music, not this, not... Let's just unite in Jesus. And those who were saying that were trying to have union with denominations. Not unity, but union. And just say, we'll agree to disagree. I was studying the Bible with someone one time, and they just said simply, we're going to have to agree to disagree because I don't agree with you. I said, there's no such animal as agreeing to disagree. It's either the truth or it's not the truth. We can't hold two polar opposite teachings and have unity and believe the same thing. Because if you go back to John 17, Jesus' prayer was that we believe the same thing. Not that we agree to disagree. That's not unity. Believing the same thing is unity. There are those who are saying that unity doesn't mean conformity. I totally disagree with that. Because how 
could such a standard of unity exist and, de and not demand conformity of something? How can we look at the seven ones of Ephesians 4, 3 through 6 and say, well, we can be united on this, but we don't have to agree on every one of those? Kind of reminds me of the first place I preached. We were studying about elders. And I mentioned this here before, but some of you weren't here. But I mentioned about elders and the qualifications of elders. And the question came up, what if all the group of men together that we choose to to put up as elders that they meet all the qualifications together. You might have one that meets two or three of them and another that meets two or three different ones and another that meets a few others and, and let's just put them all together and, and they all meet the qualifications together. That's like saying, well, I believe this part of the Bible and this part of the Bible, but you believe this other part of the Bible I don't agree with. We'll come together and have unity. It's impossible. And if we're going to have unity in the one church, we have to understand what that is. Not only understand what unity is, but understand the true teaching and doctrine of the church. Next, we endeavor for unity in the body with our fellow Christians. Perhaps this is hardest for us to do at times because people have difference opinion, differences in opinions. I don't have a problem with differences in opinions, but we can't have differences in doctrine. Our society constantly teaches us you do good what or you do what feels good to yourself. Whatever you think feels good, you do it. If you think this feels good, you do it. If you don't, you do something different. And our society has us believing now well, we don't have to conform to a certain set of rules or a certain set of doctrines or teachings as long as I feel good about what I'm doing. Folks, that's not Bible. That's the devil. And until we get the devil out of people's heads in that false doctrine, then we're never going to have unity. Remember Burger King's motto years ago? I believe it's become the national motto of America. Have it your way, right away. That's what Burger King used to say. We'll fix it your way, however you want it done. We'll fix your burger any way you want it. And people have transformed that into life to saying, I don't like it this way. I want it my way. Well, folks in the church, you're not going to have it your way right away, and I'm not going to have it my way right away. It's going to be God's way or else. And we need to understand that. When it comes to the teaching of the one church, we need to understand it's God's way. It's not what I want, what I like, what I dislike. It means that I'm going to conform to God's will and do what God teaches or what we've been taught God wants us to do through His will, the Word of God, the Bible. We have to understand that. And we have to conform to that. Christians are bombarded with the mentality every day of have it your way. And we have developed an entire generation of people that pushes that philosophy today. Why do I have to do it your way? I don't like it. Why do I have to believe this? Why do I have to go here? Why do I have to do this and that? It's like dealing with a bunch of little kids. Like I was talking about on the union. Get two kids together. Now that's saying you fight like cats and dogs. Mom said that to me and my brothers plenty of times growing up. And you folks that's got the young kids, I, I don't want to discourage you. But it really doesn't get any better when they get older. <laughs> They're just older and they still fight like cats and dogs at times. But folks, that's not the way God wants us to be as Christians. It's tempting to seek our own interest and our own ways and our own wants instead of our fellow Christians. But it's not the right thing to do. The Bible teaches us to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. So what are we going to do? have everything for ourselves, this is what I want and this is the way it's going to be? Or am I going to deny myself to help the cause of Christ? If that attitude, I'm going to deny myself and take up my cross daily and follow Christ, was in everybody's life and mind, we wouldn't deal with a lot of the problems in the church we deal with. We wouldn't deal with a lot of the problems in the world we deal with. 
But we deal with those problems because people don't want to follow God's word. They're selfish. That's all it boils down to. Some of the things that we've recently dealt with here is because of selfishness. Someone doesn't get their way, I'll show you. Is that the attitude that displays that of a Christian? Absolutely not. It's the attitude of the devil. As members of the body of Christ, we can't afford to serve ourselves when our souls are at stake. Next, there's unity in understanding the oneness of the church. Now, this was touched on earlier in the lesson. There is only one body. Ephesians 4.4 4 teaches us this. There is only one body. Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23 tells us. Let's go back to verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Notice verse 22. Jesus is head over all things to the church. Verse 23 says, which is his body? The fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church of Christ is the body of Christ. And he is the head of the body. He's the only one who has the right to rule and be that head and give us the teaching and doctrine. It's not up to man to do that. It's up to us to follow the lead of the head, Jesus Christ. The church is the body, singular in nature. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. One church, one body, the body of Christ. Colossians 1.18, the Bible simply teaches us in the first part of that verse, He is the head of the body, the church. There is one head, there is one body, and it's all wrapped up into what he says in that last phrase, those last two words, the church. Christ is the head of the church the head of the body. And the body is the church. The church is the body. And the Bible teaches us there's only one. Part of the ones of unity in Ephesians 4 and verse 4. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul demanded unity and he condemned division. Folks, denominations cause divisions. There were no denominations in the first century. Name me one denomination in the first century. We say that the church of Christ is non-denominational. We're pre-denominational. Denominations weren't even in existence when the church began. And it was that way for hundreds of years. And over the course of the last roughly 1,500 years, man, because of selfish ways, because of wants and personal desires, adulterated and perverted the gospel of Christ and formed man-made religions. And those man-made religions and teachings and doctrines are totally against the teaching of God's Word. We cannot be united in such. We cannot have union with such. We must oppose it. There's no other choice. If we don't oppose it, if we give in to it, or if we support it, then we've denied the one body. There is only one. And we must understand that. <clears throat> now let's go on to the one hope. There's unity in hope. But what is it about having hope that can bring about unity? How does hope unify us? Because it has a common goal. If we have hope, what is that hope? What are we hoping for in the end of this life? Heaven, we have a common goal. We share the same vision. The same vision is, I don't want to lose my soul in hell. I want to go to heaven. And I've got that hope of heaven. That hope is an earnest desire coupled with an expectation that God through his promises of salvation will grant us a home in heaven through our faithful life here upon this earth. That's our hope. We have that same vision. We're looking for the same results. And we're working with the same effort to obtain those results. This kind of goes back to what we're talking about in the one body as far as the conformity. We have to conform to the doctrine. 
But folks, is it so bad to conform to something? We're taught today so much in, in society that, that you're your own individual person. Humanism teaches you're your own God. You set your course. You determine where you want to go and no one else chooses that. Well, that's true as far as no one else chooses for you. You have to make your own choice. But can we not have the same goal? I had an individual I studied with one time was talking about becoming a Christian and the beauty and the joys of being a Christian. And this person said, why do I want to do that? Christians are nothing but robots just doing the same thing because that's what everybody else does. I said, you like sports? He said, yeah, I like sports. So I'm assuming everybody on the basketball team is a bunch of robots. Everybody on the football team is a bunch of robots. Everybody on the baseball team is a bunch of robots. They just do whatever everybody else does and what they're told to do. And they really don't want to do it. Well, I happen to know this person loved basketball is the reason I mentioned it first. So you like basketball. Right. You think you're a robot on the basketball court? No. What is your goal? To win. There you go. What do you think the goal of Christians are? To win. How does that make us robots? I ask him, on the basketball team, do you try to achieve the same goal to win that game? Yes. How do you do it? Work together. What do Christians do? Same thing. The ultimate goal is to win that ball game, win that tournament, win a title. Do you do it by being individuals and just doing your own thing? He said, no. There's Christianity. So you can use everyday things in life and show how Christianity can meet those same things. Actually, those can meet what Christianity does because Christianity is a lot higher than basketball, sports, or anything else. But I got the point across. At least as long as I live there, that young man never obeyed the gospel. I don't know if he ever did or not. But his attitude was the attitude of a lot of people in this world. I'm my own person. I don't want to be a Christian because y'all are robots. Y'all have to do the same thing. But if you look at every area of life, we do that anyway. Whether it's sports, whether it's family functions, when we get together as family, and we plan a gathering together, we determine, usually the ladies, get together and determine what food is going to be served, who's going to bring the food, or what's going to be brought, and then if it's like a reunion or something, if you have games or whatever you're going to do, and everybody wants to come together and do it. In business, it's the same way. A business... The owner of the company especially, he's wanting to make money or he wouldn't be in business. And in making money, he has employees. What does his employees do? They work together. Do all the, all the employees always agree with one another? No. Do Christians always agree with one another? No. But do we still work together in that one hope for the same cause, for the same goal, and the same vision? Absolutely. For a business to succeed, that boss has to impress upon his employees their need to work together, their need to accomplish their goals, and the end result is a finished product if they're building a product, and after that, it's the paycheck. <laughs> and when they do well, often bonuses. When companies have those incentives, you think the employees work harder? For a period of time, I sold insurance. I remember being in one company when I was still living in Alabama and the sales manager or the, the office manager came in and he said okay we're setting a goal for the week did this almost every week if you sell such and such and such and such this amount of product this week in insurance you're gonna get this much a bonus in your check next week one time he said I'm giving away a trip I can't remember what Bahamas or somewhere I can't remember my top salesman this week is going to win a trip. You think people pushed hard to go after that trip? I know one or two said, oh, I know who the top salesman is going to be, always is, and so why do I want to push for it? This person's not motivated. Most everybody decided we're going to work to accomplish a goal. What do you think that did for the, for the office? You think sales were up that week? Absolutely. Even for the people who didn't win the trip, you think their sales were up? Absolutely. What did that mean for them? More money in their, their check the next week. Goals. 
And in that one hope as Christians, we have a goal for heaven. It's not that one person is going to win it. This is what's different in Christianity. It's not God saying, okay, whoever does the best, I'm going to give you a special place in heaven. Everybody else, you forget it. Even though you tried, forget it. God tells us through this one hope, through his word, that when we, as faithful children of God, live as we should, we work together in unity with our brethren, and we have that same goal, that same vision, looking for the same results, and we work together, we will achieve those results. And guess what? Everybody wins. It's like being on a team. Everybody wins. We need to look at ourselves as being on the same team. We're not against each other. And brethren who sit back and say, well, I don't like brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so or the elders or the deacons or the preacher or this or that, and they're wanting to point fingers at everybody, you think they're working as team players? No, they're not. They're stirring up trouble. But when we work together, we're going to go to heaven together if we're all faithful. And if we are working together, we're going to be faithful. And God will grant us that home in heaven. That's our hope. Now I want to look at some things about that hope. The Christian has the hope for justification. Jesus is the only hope that mankind has for justification. Because of man's sins, he has been separated from God. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Isaiah wrote, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. It's not that he cannot hear. It's saying he will not hear if we're in sin. Man's sin separates him from God. When we sin, we're separated. And there's no remedy that man can invent to apply the healing for the division caused between man and God. There's only one hope. There's only one way. In the book of Romans chapter 7 verses 24 and the first part of verse 25, Paul wrote, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Notice the first part of verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is one hope. That hope is Christ. And we're justified by Jesus today and given that hope of eternal life. Without it, there is no hope. Without what Jesus did on the cross for us, we would all be lost. But because he died for us on the cross and shed his blood... That gives us that hope, that earnest desire coupled with our expectation, wanting heaven, and we're going to achieve that by living a faithful Christian life, conforming to God's will through His Word to one day be in heaven. And it is our hope that we're justified by obeying Jesus and living for Him. Titus chapter 2, or chapter 3 rather, verses 4 through 7. Paul wrote Titus and said, But after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Notice is after the kindness and love of God of God, our Savior. Jesus did what He did for us. And we're justified today by Jesus when we conform to His will in that one hope and obedience. And it is by that hope that we draw near to God today. The Hebrew writer wrote in Hebrews 7 verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of a better hope did by the which we draw near to God. What was that better hope? The Hebrew writer is contrasting the old versus the new. That better hope is the new covenant, the New Testament through Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed on Calvary for us. Then how does this unite us? 
It unites us by us recognizing in whom our hope lies. And that's Jesus. It unites us when we submit in obedience to this one hope. It also unites us in appealing to others to come to this hope. Not only can we enjoy this hope, but we need to teach others about the hope that they can have and can enjoy. There's only one hope for man's justification today. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to Colossians in Colossians 1.23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature under heaven, whereof I, Paul, have made a minister. If we continue. Notice the conditional statement. If we continue. Not just continue, but he said grounded and settled. As you come into my neighborhood right now, and it's been going on for the last six months, I think this is the everlasting construction. It's never going to end. It doesn't seem like. They came in and they tore up. We have a four lane coming into our neighborhood and then it goes into two lane just right past the road where we turn. And so they've got everything to a two lane right now. The other lane is completely torn up. About three or four months ago, they tore everything up. They dug it all out, hauled all kind of things away. They brought dirt in. They've packed it. They put tar on the dirt. They've packed it again. They put some more tar on the dirt. They've packed it again. And I'm wondering if they're ever going to come back because they haven't been there in two weeks. I know it's rained, but it's dry now. And I rode through yesterday looking at it, and I said, that's the prettiest, sandiest, packed down dirt that I've ever seen. It looks like it's harder than concrete. It's been sitting there long enough, rained on it enough. They've put rollers on it enough, and it's still there. I believe they've got that pretty well grounded and settled. All they need to do is bring their paving equipment in, and we can at least have that lane opened up. But you never know when that stuff's going to happen. I know it's Texas. There's construction all the time, just about everywhere. But I looked at that packed down dirt and said, I don't believe you can pack it any tighter than they could pack it. It's there. It's settled. When we look at our hope as Christians, if we are grounded and we're settled in that hope of the gospel and we're not moved away from it, we have that hope of eternal life. But next, the Christian has hope also in motivation. Hope motivates us. It is a reason why there are so many songs that we sing in our songbooks about heaven. These songs can motivate us to one day obtain that hope. Having that hope encourages us to live in the way we ought to live. The hope of the Christian is based upon the promise of God that if we're faithful, God will reward us. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning verse 15, it says, And so... After he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by a greater, and an oath of, for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. There's an oath given. Notice this oath in verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now notice verses 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here's our hope. And our hope is an anchor. It is that solid foundation. It's an anchor of the soul. And it's sure and steadfast that we have eternal life awaiting us if we're faithful. How does this unite us? Well, when we share the same motivation, as Christians, we can accomplish more. We can work together and accomplish more to get there. And when we share the same motivation, we can help each other keeps sin out of our lives. And finally, the Christian hope offers us salvation. 
the Christian has a hope of eternal salvation. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, But let us, who are the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and in helmet, the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation is our helmet in our Christian warfare. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. Our hope is to be in Jesus' presence at His coming. Notice in this verse he says, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? What is our hope? We, in our, we know our hope is in Christ through His gospel. And ultimately our hope truly is in heaven. Again, Paul wrote to Colossians in Colossians 1.5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel? That hope is laid up in heaven. And it should be our desire to be in heaven one day. By understanding the unity of the Spirit and endeavoring to keep that unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace through the seven ones that have been discussed throughout this day in this lectureship. And ultimately, what I've just delivered the one church and the one hope. You tie all these ones together. Be faithful in the teaching of God's word in each of these ones. And those seven ones of unity will get us to heaven because everything that you read in the Bible can be found one point or another in these seven ones. For without these things, there is no hope. But because what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the death on the cross, and through the Spirit's Word which was given to us, now in our written form where we can read and study and obey, we have that hope of heaven. If you're here today and you're not a child of God, you never obeyed Jesus Christ, then you have an opportunity to enjoy that hope, to be part of that one body, to serve that one Lord, have that one faith in that one baptism, and enjoy the blessings of our Father, the one God. And if we can do those things and obey Jesus Christ, we can enjoy heaven. If you're not a Christian, you can't obey Jesus today. If you believe with all your heart Jesus Christ is a Son of God, you can obey the gospel through your faith, through your repentance, confessing your faith in Him. And that one baptism that's already been talked about today, the baptism in water for the remission of your sins, where you'll reach the blood of Jesus to be saved, and enjoy that one hope. Having had that hope, if you've turned away from it, and you've gone back into the world and a life of sin, this invitation is also for you. That you can renew your faith once again, because if you're away from the faith, and you're not following that one hope, your faith is weakened, your faith may be dying. You can be strengthened today as you realize you're living in sin. You know there's a need to change your life. Repent of your sins and confess them. We'll pray for you, encourage you, and help you any way we can to build up that one hope in your life to have heaven as your home. If you are subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, come right now. Why together we stand and